Hi all, let's continue our exploration of the world of chess and look at very famous players of each country, the legends, which are not currently active on the FIDO rating list uh, or may have deceased. Now Rogers thankfully is still with, with us, Ian Rogers from Australia. He was the first Australian to become a chess grandmaster. Although uh, technically Australian born uh, US grandmaster Walter Brown uh, was a bit earlier. But um, Ian Rogers achieved his grandmaster title in 1985 after becoming an international master in 1980. He was Australia's highest rated player for over 20 years and represented Australia at 14 chess Olympiads, 12 of them on board on, on board one, first board. Rogers won more than 100 tournaments, including 15 round robin grandmaster tournaments. He won the Australian Championship four times in 1980 86, 1998, and 2006. Among his career highlights are three consecutive victories from 1988 to 1990 in the grandmaster tournament in Groningen, outright by a clear point in 1988 and 1989, and jointly in 1990. Before turning professional, Ian Rogers completed a BSc in Meteorology from the University of Melbourne. He is married to Cathy Rogers, herself an international arbiter, woman FIDE master and a lawyer. Throughout his competitive career, and more so since his retirement from competitive chess in July 2007, Rogers reported on many tournaments for various media outlets with photographic assistance from Cathy Rogers. He was a panellist for BBC TV. TV during the 1993 World Championship carriage coverage and covered numerous major tournaments for news agency routers. So Rogers has also worked as a public commentator at high level tournaments around the world and he is the cousin of Australian cricketer Chris Rogers. So bio aside let's have a look at this fascinating game played in Switzerland Biel in 1993. His opponent Kirill Georgiev playing white played d4 and Rogers played knight f6 and after c4, c5, d5, Rogers played the very ambitious Benko Gambit system. Slightly controversial. White took the pawn and after a6 now, White played e3. Let's have a quick look at my book for the popularity of e3. It's the third most popular move here. Most popular is taking the a6 pawn, also popular as b6, but e3, fairly solid move. g6 now, knight c3, bishop g7, and here usually uh, knight f3 or a4 are played. a4 was played here, black castled, and the usual move is actually to play knight f3, but uh, white played now rook a3, which addresses the a takes b issue if the rook is not loose on a1 sometimes that could be a problem it's now protected by the pawn on b2 we see now bishop b7 hitting the d5 pawn a little bit more for the moment white is not concerned knight f3 but here now e6 putting more pressure on d5 white now takes d takes e6 after f takes e potentially these pawns look quite menacing in the center if black can get in d5, but now white cuts through that ambition with queen d6, not only blocking the pawn, but attacking c5. <clears throat> this next move from in Rogers, queen c8, usefully protects c5. Now it's only the queen which needs to be evicted with a move like knight e8, and then this d pawn can move. White now plays bishop e2. First though in this position instead of knight e8, black actually played a takes b5. After a takes b5, now the move knight e8 was played. The queen went back to d2 and now black played d5. So black here seems to have very interesting compensation for the pawn. And note these are double pawns anyway, so white's extra pawn doesn't seem too dangerous at the moment. We see now rook takes a8, after bishop takes a8, white castled. Now knight d7, white now plays b3, 
with the idea potentially of either challenging this bishop on diagonal or targeting this pawn, which can sometimes be a bit of a weakness. Knight e to f6, bishop b2, and now black ambitiously pushed e5. So is this pawn going to be weak? Because white can actually build up pressure with knight a4 and rook c1. White plays knight a4 here. There's also some pressure on e5. Black now played queen b8. And we see queen c2. So threatening knight takes c5 now potentially. So black protected this c5 pawn with knight e4. And white now played knight d2. Knight takes d2, queen takes d2. And again, rook c1 looks dangerous for the c5 pawn. So black has got to start doing something against this. d4, it opens up the bishop here on this diagonal. Does white really have king safety issues? e takes d4 was played. e takes d4. The engine suggests this might not have been the absolute best move. Maybe c takes d4 could have been technically better to so just remove that potentially weak c pawn. But there's an upside to this. If this c pawn can be used as bait somehow for black to get even more compensation on the king side. White now played bishop a3. This might not be the best immediate exploitation of black's pawns. Perhaps better was bishop c4 check in this position uh, with the idea of rook e1. And this, this would be quite interesting. Say bishop e5 here. This might be very good for white after knight takes c5, for example. But uh, in the game, we see this immediate bishop a3. And actually, after bishop e5, white has some, some problems which have to be addressed accurately here now. An accurate move is definitely required in this position. Both of these bishops are looking down white's king side. So is this really a problem though? Well, in this position, the best move is actually bishop c4 check. This wasn't played after king h8. It appears it might be possible to play knight takes c5 here. Before we get into that, let's see the game continuation and get back to this critical position. White actually took the pawn on c5. Okay, so this looks quite dangerous. What is black wanting to do here? Well, black took on h2. After king h1, what does black want to do in this position? Well, the knight is attacked. If knight b6, then this could be very good for white with, say, bishop g4 or queen takes d4. This could be a very, very good position. But black plays an amazing move in this position. Can you spot it? If I give you 10 seconds, you might want to pause the video. Okay, Ian Rogers, the next move of Ian Rogers ended the game. Bishop takes g2 check was played and white actually resigned. So why did white resign? Well, king takes g2. Can you see what black would play in this position? 10 seconds starting from now, you might want to pause the video again. Right, there'll be a real bone crushing move here. Rook takes f2. And if king takes f2, then queen g3 is mate. And if king h1, then queen a8 check is mating. This is only t delaying the mate. For example, that diagonal. So that's a really crushing move. Rook takes f2. If rook takes f2, 
queen g3 check, king f1, queen g1 is checkmate. So that's why rook takes f2 is so powerful here. It just is a forced mate. Let's look just earlier if it could have been avoided. Uh, so I mentioned uh, that uh, bishop a3 might have been a major mistake here. On bishop c4 check, as mentioned, king h8, rook e1, bishop e8. Uh, do these tactics work, say, in this position? This is the engine suggestion. So knight takes c5. If knight takes c5 here, uh, white has an amazing idea. Actually, this is just an engine variation. Uh, so it shows how this this can be really dangerous for black, actually. It's quite amazing, this resource for white here. Why this works for white now. If I gave you 10 seconds to think about what would you play with white hair starting from now. Okay, an amazing counter resource for white. Queen takes d4. So these two bishops will be raking, complimenting each other against black's king. You know, takes, takes. This is mating black <laughs> with the two bishops like that. So um, this idea is very, very interesting uh, to play this bishop c4 check first. And then this knight takes c5 to try and break through here. So knight takes, queen takes. There'll be very little uh, black could do. Uh, knight e6 is it's just delaying the inevitable bishop takes. And it's absolutely winning for white. So this would be very, very interesting. You might think, well, does this bishop takes h2 work here? Not very well. This this line now doesn't work particularly well at all. Uh, king takes. The difference here, this, this doesn't work, work. Rook takes f2. There's either king takes or queen takes even. Queen takes is, is fine. There's no nothing going on there. So you see that that crucial f2 pawn that uh, in the main line of the game uh, it was the queen was actually um, not able to protect f2 and this bishop wasn't usefully cutting down against black's king but uh, that's in the background of uh, an otherwise brilliant finish to a human versus human game so this is a beautiful finish i thought bishop takes g2 here shows great tactical imagination and very courageous play in the opening to play the controversial Banco Gambit. I hope you enjoyed this uh, game and uh, comments or questions on YouTube. Thanks very much.